Hey everybody, what's happening? This is V3Cast, episode number seven. This is Voyager 3's official podcast. Fellas, what is going on this evening? It's time to rock and roll. That's, That's right. Know. That's right. You know, walk, talk walk, movies. walk over to the Marshall Stack, turn it up to 11, and you'll be turn good to go. Turn it up to 11. Yes. <laughs> Man, there is so much stuff happening in our bubble and elsewhere. I, I, every time I... I check the emails. There's more stuff happening. There's this sold out, this being added, and I'm looking online and I'm seeing a new trailer for films. I'm seeing that some people passed away. It's crazy. It's it, this is a really busy like two weeks, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. A lot oh, of good man. stuff coming out. Absolutely I'm excited. Right. Absolutely right. Hey, before we talk about any of that cool stuff, I gotta know what are y'all drinking, man? Hey, man, you were hyping your pick up, so you go first this time. Oh, okay. Well, you guys know how I love ginger beer, so tonight I have a ginger beer handy, and it's one of my go-to ones is Gosling's ginger beer. It's a very good one. It's very spicy, and I, I really dig it. It's on uh, – I kind of have a little bit of a list. Do you guys want to hear my little hierarchy list of ginger beer? Of course. Top, top 10. It's, it's kind of fun. Top so, 20 ginger beers, Steve. Top, top 20? Oh, my God. Um, well, <laughs> this list has a little bit of an asterisk, and I'll tell you why that is. Is because there's one that's my absolute favorite, but you can't buy it like in stores. It's only at this place in La, uh, in um, New Orleans, and it's called Hoo Hoo's Ginger Brew, and it is by far the best one of any ginger beer I've had. So that's my favorite one, but you can't really count that because you can only get it at one place. It's on tap. Um, at that place. So besides that, my uh, my number one favorite ginger beer that you can get normally around in, in stores is called Cock and Bull. It's really oh. good stuff. It's uh, whoa, really whoa, spicy. Whoa, whoa, Steve. Hey. You can't, you can't just breeze past that name. <laughs> right. Hey, you can't say that. <laughs> yeah. This is an adult podcast. That's Don't right. Don't Oh, it's really That's good. You. Super spicy. So, I think it might so be at not Costco. So you're cock and bull tonight? Nope, nope. I, you, you have to go to Costco to get that, I believe. Um, because the, the, the couple times I've had it, it was it was bought for me. So I never actually picked it up myself. And every every store I go to around where I live, nobody has it. So I, I think it might be Costco. What um, is it, what's the label look like? It's very simple. <laughs> it's like an all-black can. And it's just kind of a simple font written out and i think it's just the, the, the uh outline of the font there's no they don't have no. any like big picture on there or anything nope like nice drawing <laughs> or anything right aaron's fishing yeah yeah what are you getting at man <laughs> <laughs> so i want to see what was drawing you to it so so strongly uh the 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 heat of the ginger root gotcha okay yes indeed right. um then uh, mm -hmm. after that is uh, Gosling's pretty much, um, but although Q is right up there with it, um, Q is around. They make tonic water too, and uh, what else do they make? I think a ginger ale um, and a ginger beer, really good. Um, and then Gosling's is right up there. And believe it or not, that uh, that one from Australia in the orange can with the really odd top, like it's it's a pull tab, but nothing like we have here in the states because it's from Australia, and that's. Uh, Bundaroo or something like that. That that's a good one. So, uh, yep. Tonight, so I got Gosling's. Cheers. So, so shout out to uh, Hoo Hoo's. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. And the next time I go to New Orleans, Hoo Hoo's and Cock and Bulls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. you totally. Need to know your ginger beer. It should be easy to remember. That's right. Oh yeah, and in the practice space, there's there's the Australian stuff in there. So. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was wondering if I got that one that was your favorite, but I got at least it's in your top three or four. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They're all good, man, for sure. Cool. Cool. All right, um, Greg. Greg right. said he prepared this time. He really dialed in, and he he knows what what's going on tonight. So I got I got well, you, <laughs> you guys like to rake me over the coals if I don't have all the info. Yeah. So yep, that, that's right. It should come as no <laughs> no surprise. It's another three Floyds. This one's called the fifty the fifty dollar fifty million dollar man. Nice. Cool. 
Man, the artwork on your cans is always just spectacular. And yeah. when you drink that, does it go da 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 I think it does. So nice. it's a double IPA, 9% ABV, pretty high. And it's only available January through March. So Oh, it's a seasonal one. Okay. You can find it. $50 million man. Sweet. It's good, it's good artwork. I know. What you got, Aaron? Old standby here. Old faithful. Oh, Modelo. yeah. It's always hard to get the glare off, but hopefully people can dig that. Yeah. Modelo, it goes down smooth. That's my slogan for it. There if you I go. were ever do a commercial for them, that's what I would say. And of course, uh, you know, every time you guys drink that at rehearsal, you always have the uh, glass bottle with the foil on the yeah. top. And I always refer to that as your Bartles and James because it just totally looks like a Bartles and James <laughs> bottle from, you know, the late 80s or something. Right. <laughs> well, that, you know, that the bottle is great and it looks super cool and fancy. The only problem is when you're drinking it, you have to like, yeah, really get those little pieces out. of. Yeah, because you yeah. don't want that on your mouth. Your mouth doesn't you want the, anything to do with foil ever. No, uh, yeah, definitely you got not. foil between your teeth. You know, <laughs> no, that's no not fun. So. That's why the cans come in handy because when you don't want to get super fancy and and prove yourself to all your friends, you can just get the can and you have the good, great taste of Modelo, but the simplicity of just flipping it up. There. Just the pop top, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's up the with dark? that? They have to figure out how to way to make the the look of the foil, but without it getting all over your your lips and gums and stuff, man. That's no fun. <laughs> right? It's got to like it's got to come off easier. That's all. Just make it not so sticky. Put a perf make on there. A, come on. Put a, put a what? Put one perf all the way around it, and then it just exactly. rips right off. It's good to go. Perfect. Modelo, <laughs> listen to us. We love your stuff, but we don't want foil in our on our lips. I know, man. That's yeah. that's no good. Cheers. We got a lot of topics to cover. So uh, let's stay on point, Greg. <laughs> okay. I'm here to derail progress. Topic number one. Are you ready? I couldn't yes. believe yeah. when I saw this on YouTube. And I think, did Greg text it? I can't remember. I did. Yeah, Greg See? texted it. I um, helped. I contribute. Dario Argento has a new film coming out and it's called Ocali Neri, which is th black glasses, but I'm going to call it Ocali Neri all night because I, I, I love the will. Italian language and the films from that era. That That's my jam. So uh, when, when we're, whenever we're talking about Italian movies, as, as you'll see in a couple minutes, uh, I'll always refer to it, say, as like, you know, uh, beyond the darkness and Steve will go, Oh, you mean Buy Omega? And he, he <laughs> loves to keep it, Legit. I can't help it, man. I can't help it. <laughs> You'll always call it by the Italian name. Respect. Ocali Neri comes out soon. Um, it's already got some festivals overseas, um, like a German film festival and a couple of others. I, I watched the trailer. I, I watched the um, Italian trailer and the one with uh, English subtitles. And to me, it looks absolutely fantastic like exactly what you would expect um kind of old school dario argento yeah. to be it's it's brutal and it has a you know an attempted murder right off the bat and the lady loses her sight because of this attempted murder so she's blind now they they always do stuff like that in the in in those uh, 70s Great. movies bring it man i love it mm -hmm. um the uh the star is uh uh elinia Past pastorelli um, she's an Italian actress that, believe it or not, has only been acting since 2016. Um, so this is um, another film she's in. Um, and I like the music. That's um, Arnaud and of course, Robotini. Of course, it has, it has his daughter. Oh, yeah. Asia, Asia's Argento. in there for sure. She's, uh, you, can't, you can't not you can't have her You can't make a there. move without Asia Argento. She's the best. There you go. Right, right. Um, I don't think I saw her in the trailer, though. So they must be yeah. holding, holding back. Is she in the trailer? She's in the trailer. Okay. She's the one it. who's describing when she says, what can you see? And she's like, well, there's people playing over there and there's a van over there. And she goes, a van. Yeah. The white van. Yeah, the yes. white van. So. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, cool, man. Yeah. Um, it just looks to me just like what you'd want to have from Dario Argento. And I have a, like a little suspicion as maybe to why, well, two reasons, actually. The first one is that this is a film that was, uh, 
written in 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 2002, but it uh, it didn't end up getting made because the the producer he was working with, Dario Argento was working with at the time, um, his company went bankrupt, so it uh, it kind of got shelved basically. And then uh, Asia was writing her book that's out now, I believe, uh, but she was writing it probably like during COVID time, and she discovered the script and and kind of brought it back to life and you know probably probably brought it back to her father and said hey what about this or whatever something like that and now it's uh it's it's been made so uh and it's a completely italian production instead of sometimes i feel like sometimes his maybe late 90s or early 2000s films had like american money and production thrown in at it and i think that americans want a different kind of a film nowadays from Dario Argento so he's probably like having to like tug a war and push and pull with like the American control part of it wanting it to appeal to American audiences and you know what what he does is its own thing you know so the fact that this is a, an entirely Italian production from what I understand I think that's a good thing yeah that can only be a good thing for sure yeah authentic yeah what what a time to be alive yep. another Argento movie come on man I know. I believe it Good. said he's 81 years old and still making films. Man, keep on going. Do it to it. Yeah. That's what I say. As long as it's fun for him, <clears throat> please do because we love it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Even a not so good Dario Argento movie is still okay with me. You know, I mean, yep. bring it. Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, one other tidbit I read is uh, I don't know how much of a, of a theatrical release it's going to get. It's kind of not really said right now on some of the articles that I've searched. But uh, Shudder picked up the exclusive streaming rights. So whenever it does go to streaming, you can watch it on Shudder. So that's really cool because that's, you know, everybody who subscribed can watch it and you can subscribe anytime you want to. So it's not like there's a, you know, a, a barrier to see this film once it's on streaming. So very cool. I've been on, and I've been I've been telling on, you guys. <clears throat> I've been on the fence with Shudder for months now, and I think that'll be what tips me over. Same, yeah. same. Yeah. And then speaking of Dario Argento, I was going to ask you guys to give me like a couple of your favorite films of his because, I mean, his career spans so long and he has so many different films covering a lot of different ground. Uh, what's a couple that really, really resonate with you? Um, I would say Inferno. Definitely Inferno. Um, I remember I was watching that movie uh, for the first time and when there's a scene in the in the early in the movie where the woman has a reason to go down to the basement of this apartment building she's living in and the basement is just like a, a band it looks like an abandoned building but the 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 building is functional but the basement is all all gnarly and it's also flooded so like it's like going down into the sub basement it's there's it's just completely flooded and and uh the the water comes up into part of the the basement of this building and she she goes down there she's looking around she's trying to find out how how deep this this flood goes or how what what's down there in that other level and her her necklace falls off and goes into the water and in my head i'm watching this for the first time and i'm going well she's definitely not going to go into the water, right? I mean, she's <laughs> in this like creepy basement and there's nobody around, but she does. And I, and right when she went in, I was like, okay, this movie is just like a dream. There's no real logic. There's no, there's nothing that's supposed to be realistic about it. It's, it's what would happen if your if your subconscious mind took over as far as storytelling. And then she goes into that water and it's just the most surreal moment. Yeah. One of the most surreal moments I've ever seen in a movie. So I fell in love with the movie instantly then. And the whole movie is great. It's gory. It's weird. Most of it doesn't make much sense, which is great. It's like a nightmare, watching a nightmare. Um, also, of course, Suspiria. I love Suspiria. That's the first Argento movie I ever saw. Um, John, our, our old guitarist, introduced us. Our old guitarist from our old band, Forge, introduced us to... Um, to uh, Suspiria, and I love that. But another one that's kind of, um, it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's as good as these other two, but I love it still, um, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, because yeah. I saw like a scene from that when I was a little kid, 
and didn't know what it was and didn't know what part of the movie it was or anything about it. But it was so creepy. And uh, I always wondered what that was for years, for decades, actually. And then one day I was watching that movie a few years ago and it gets to the end of the movie. And uh, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is that scene. It, it has to do with that sort of how he's able to look into that what looks like a dollhouse, like the open room house. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Movie where he sees a murder in there. Right. Yeah. It's like an art yeah. gallery and the guy's looking yeah. through the plate glass window and he's like, you can't do anything. And he's like, right. Frozen. You know, I think he's even hitting the glass, I think. And uh, yeah, it just doesn't work. They can't hear him or whatever. Yeah. It's awesome. And then at the end, they go back to that, that place. And that's where that scene takes place where, where the person's trying to kill him. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is that movie from when I was like eight years old. And uh, so it was really cool to, to discover that. And that's so those are my top three. Nice, nice. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage because that's actually one of mine as well. And that was his first film. So oh. what a way to start, you know, super uh, mysterious. And that was like really when like that's like the dictionary definition of a giallo. It's like. Mm -hmm you know, who did this? And you know, spend the whole film trying to figure it out. And slowly but surely, different people get X'd off the list. Well, it can't be them. You know, it's mm -hmm. just really super awesome. And yeah, that whole sequence was filmed so masterfully, so tense. Some of it is like, uh, you know, it, it feels like you're deprived of a sense because you can't, or the character can't uh, communicate. So you, you feel that same way. And, and it's just mm -hmm. kind of like, jarring or just you know closing off a sense it's really really super cool yeah i would say that uh suspiria for me as well because it's just it, it really is like a, a a nightmare where you just kind of go through these different chapters of the story and it, it is like a dream because it's not like super cohesive and and i believe that's by design i think he wants it to be uh disorienting and just weird and the colors of, i mean i think everybody comments about the colors in most of his films but Suspiria in particular it's just so gorgeous to look at I remember when we when we uh filmed Oguantonera I was just trying to kind of do things along those lines uh, as much as I could with this small amount of lights that we had to work with and being outside it was difficult to light outside that way but we tried our best <laughs> yeah we did we yes, definitely did. uh ripped him off a little bit for sure <laughs> Greg how about you man yeah you know, so for me, it's the same as you guys, pretty much. I mean, I'm, I'll throw Tenebrae in there, and I'll throw Phenomena in there just for the star power. Right. You know, you watch you watch uh, Phenomena. It's got Jennifer Connelly and Donald Pleasance, you know. Right. It's nice to see Donald Pleasance in a role that isn't Halloween, you know. So. Totally true. Escape from New York. Yeah, he didn't get a ton of American <laughs> actors in his film, so when he did, it definitely stood out. So that, that is pretty cool. But the thing, the thing that I want to stress that you guys didn't touch on is, the th you know, along with the lights and the way that those films look, the other thing that defines them is Goblin. Oh, 100%. And, yeah. And part of the reason I chose the three that I did is because of the music for those three. Yeah. In particular, for me, are, are three of the better Goblin scores. You know, I can, uh, I can go back to those over and over and just never get tired of them. So. Yeah, the bass line that uh, Pignatelli plays on on the title track to, to to Tenebrae is just absolutely fantastic. It actually came on my yeah. Spotify today when I was driving around, and there's like a little bit of a chorus on the bass and or a little bit of like a slapback, but a ping pong slapback echo on it or something like that because what, it's such a stereo sounding bass when typically a, a bass is very mono uh standardly anyway so w w when he plays that riff you can hear it bouncing around in both ears it really makes that yep. stand out for sure it's a very cool trick to, to do on that track speaking of goblin and dario argento and asia argento we definitely have to um give maximum uh tribute and credit to uh daria nicolodi who uh passed away in 2020 that's uh uh, Dario Argento's partner from uh, 1974 to 1985, and it's uh, Asia Argento's mom. However, she was the one who discovered Goblin. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but 
you know, maybe they played live around where she lived or something like that. And she discovered that band and she was the one who took them to Dario Argento or, or said to Dario, you have to, you know, use this in, in, in your films. So that was the beginning of kind of the link up of all of that whole thing, which is now legendary, historic, uh, you know, we would be doing a different kind of music if uh, if that didn't exist. So uh, she gets a lot of credit for sure. That's awesome. So she's, a, so she's the Curtis Spieler of that generation. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I suppose so, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, some, and you know, she's been in a handful of his films too. Um, and other ones, like uh, a classic that I love is uh, Shock. She's the main character in uh in shock that's uh not argento but super excellent kind of a supernatural horror film with a absolutely phenomenal soundtrack um by a band called libra which has a couple people from goblin um uh marizio guarini from goblin was in there i even think maybe fabio frizzi was in libra it's kind of like a mashup of a lot of those names of that uh of that time, like maybe um, Gasolini maybe was in there too. I, I'd have to look it up, but um, Libra was kind of like a, a mashup of a bunch of those famous Italian musicians, and they produced um, the soundtrack for for Shock. It was really, it's really super cool and and like heady. I think it's kind of um, Italian soundtrack uh, psychedelic sort of. It's really cool. Okay, so for our next topic, I thought this was cool. This comes up in my head quite often. So I thought, let's ask the guys and even our viewers, because uh, I want to know if you guys know of any cool ones. But my, my uh, question to you is, give me two completely unsung or underappreciated scenes or monologues from any film that you like, any era. Greg, you go first. <laughs> all right so when you sent me the itinerary you said underrated scenes or montages so i'm sticking to montage <laughs> and the best Oops. montage that was ever filmed is in a seek the fourth sequel to a movie <laughs> so i'm gonna go ahead and say that it has to be underrated because it's in the fourth movie and that's rocky for training montage oh yeah absolutely the top notch the whole dynamic between the steroid guy and working out in nature and then you've got russia versus the united states and then that score you well, know is vince just, DiCola. come on now vince yeah. DiCola. it's just <laughs> ridiculous it's the best it's the best training montage ever and uh i don't know if it's underrated or unsung or underappreciated because i hold it in such high regard right. that i can't imagine it it is but well, I it might it might be in comparison to like Rocky one or two, <clears throat> perhaps, maybe I don't know. But, but yeah, if, if I asked my mom if the the original Rocky training montage was better than Rocky four, I'm I'm pretty sure she'd say the original. Right you on. know, so I think if you ask the normal person, but for me, it's Rocky four. Stallone's it. got that beard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Come on, man. He's like. <laughs> Messing, messing with the KGB, getting them to like crash their BMW. It's yeah. If you're ever feeling Mercedes down about yourself or sorry for yourself and, uh, and uh, you know, you're not sure if you can get out of bed today and, and, and do what you got to do, watch that yeah. and, 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 that and, and you'll on. kick the rest of the day right in the ass. <laughs> yep. Okay, so Aaron, good. how about you, man? Well, it was hard for me to come up with something that really – um really followed the rules because i felt like any scene or any montage or whatever that i came up with was stuff that was well known as being great and i couldn't really think of anything unsung or underrated but what i did do is i approached it sort of i mean from a different angle but it's sort of the same thing so i thought of two underrated movies and like my favorite scene in each one Right so on. I think the scene would have to be underrated because the movie is underrated. Makes sense. And they're to me. underrated in a weird way because both of them are movies that are popular. Both of them are overshadowed by their sequels. So first I have Terminator, which, you know, um is one of my favorite movies of all time. Terminator 2 kind of takes a lot of glory because of the special effects. Yeah. And um 
but Terminator 2 is really just a remake of Terminator 1. And I've I love always Terminator said that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but Terminator 1 beats everything to me. Um, so, you know, yeah, to, <laughs> to take, you know, so the scene I'm talking about is at, at the end when they've just gone through this crazy uh, truck chase and Kyle Reese is, is injured. He's barely alive. He's barely able to walk. He's, he's, he's totally messed up and she's desperate. She has to keep him moving. Now, this is the guy who saved her life, kept her, kept her living, protected her for the whole movie, but he's still just a man. He's still about to check out and she has to dig in deep and be become what she's meant to be, which she would have never thought she was capable of you have this woman who was a just a cute waitress in the beginning uh, like like a night ago right for for the timeline of the movie it was like a night or two (laughs) right and she has to transform into this woman who is going to not only give birth to like the, the savior of you know humankind but also she has to be able to make him into that savior she has to be a tough woman so that 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 earlier self of her she has to shed it and when is she going to do it is she going to do it uh after the movie is over or is she going to start doing it during the movie and so when he's like barely able to move and and she's like come on come on let's go and then she finally just thinks about it for a second she goes on your feet soldier and she starts barking commands at him i'm like oh motherfucker now we're talking this is the (laughs) woman here and uh, and she gets him because that's what breaks through with all of his training and all of his experience, and that's what motivates him and gets him back up. And then now she's protecting him, and now she's the one who who has to save herself. And and uh, after he's done everything to keep her alive, and she's the one who who kills the bad guy, and that's amazing. So that scene when they're when they're on their way to the uh, into the into that industrial plant. Um, man, that does it. Scene. As soon as we're finished with this uh, podcast, I'm watching Terminator. God damn. Right. right. <laughs> and then the other one is the same kind of thing. It's Mad Max because, um, you know, in, in America, we didn't know Mad Max first. We knew Road Warrior. When I was a little kid, I was watching Road Warrior. and It was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. My yeah. dad, you know, my dad loved it. And I loved it. And then a couple of years later, I'm watching, you know, Channel 50 or something, and and there's Mad there's Mad Max, and I'm like, well, wait, what is this? Is this the same story? Is this the same guy? He looks younger. Why does he have a family? When did? And as a like an eight year old, you don't understand the, necessarily the timeline going right. on, and and you you have to figure it out. Like, oh wait, no, this is before that one. So, you know, it was huge in Australia, but not in America until time went by and so um mad max i feel is an underrated movie um road warrior is amazing but mad max you you couldn't have road warrior without mad max to show why he became that guy and how everything he lost losing his family and everything and and the, the idea of these police officers trying holding on by a thread to maintain this this order this last vestige of society before i mean as as the world is crumbling yeah and uh, I always assumed kind of they don't really make it explicit, but I always assumed that nuclear war was happening in other parts of the world, but it hadn't gotten to Australia yet. That's what and, I thought too. Yeah. And uh, so these guys are trying to maintain order and it's a losing battle, right? So right in the beginning you have the, the night rider and he's, he's tearing through this, the countryside on this road and all the, all the, uh, the main force patrol are trying to stop him. They're all failing miserably but he's making his way out farther and farther away. And as soon as, you know, as soon as he gets into Max's territory, it's, it's going to be shut down. So the way they introduce Max little bits, you know, showing his jacket, showing the side of his face, showing him like out on the side of his car, hearing the radio, not really engaging with anything. And then finally, when he gets into that, that car and peels off down the road, I mean, when he goes into that chase, the night rider starts crying and he he had just been like the most evil tough dude for the last like 10 minutes for that chase and now he knows he's all done cuz the interceptor has just entered the the fray and then they still don't even show max's face until that crash and he runs out of the car and the he does that that george miller um 
zoom close in. up. Yeah. You know, uh, that style that's kind of sped up close up and then he's there. And then, so that, so that introduction of Max, that whole first chase scene in Mad Max, I would say, uh, is one of my favorite scenes ever. I mean, we could do this all night though. There's a right. million. Though I'll go with those two. Oh, that's great. Those are two really good ones for sure. That all that makes sense to me. The whole logic of why you chose it. Very cool. These are two of mine that uh I've kind of had in the back of my head for quite a long time. Um the first one is uh um Scrooged 1988 uh, Bill Murray starring <laughs> of course. Um I was not expecting that. Was anybody <laughs> expecting that? No, I wasn't expecting Scrooge. Um, no? Well, All right. Okay. It wasn't so just me then. There's this crazy part that, you know, if you if you think about it, it doesn't even really need to be into the, in the film at all. Um, the only thing that it does really is give you a little more weight when, when uh, Bill Murray's character finds that homeless guy frozen um, under, under the sidewalk area, whatever, you know, kind of toward the third act. They're just before the third act, I guess. Um, but still, it, it's just a random, to me, scene that uh, it's it's just weird that it's there. But the fact that it's there makes it absolutely just fantastic in, in the film. But it's where the two, um, the the well, it's actually three homeless people. For some reason, they uh, they mistake Bill Murray for Richard Burton for some reason they think he looks like him so they keep calling him dick because they they feel like they know richard burton enough to call him dick so so they start asking him to recite you know some famous lines uh from some, from his film so <laughs> bill murray starts doing the impersonation of richard burton and he's like uh um you know uh four square four, you know the, the fall of chops uh by the I false wow. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> so good, sure. man. It's and, been a long time. And while he's doing that that impersonation, they cut to the three homeless people, uh, which is one of them is the lady from, you know, the mom from Goonies and the mom from Thor Mama from the Train. I forgot her name, but she's phenomenally funny. Yeah. She's um good. the the two guys like kind of fall on each other and they're like oh it's just so good i can't believe oh, I, I, we're here we get to hear this right now it's so wonderful <laughs> this is the way they deliver that acting yeah. and everything it's absolutely fantastic so for years and years and years i didn't even know what in the hell that was i didn't know who richard burton was i, I never saw cleopatra um etc cetera, etc cetera. so i don't know five six seven years ago i finally want one christmas because I, I usually watch it every christmas i finally stopped and i'm like I researched what in the hell is this and I found out the whole thing of it and so then I'm like well let me google see if, if there's a scene of Cleopatra and there is and it's that and it's like a famous part in Cleopatra that he's delivering the line and and I'll be damned if if, if uh, Bill Murray didn't just nail that, that impersonation he, he nails it it sounds just like him <laughs> so nice. it's really cool I've, and I've always loved that scene like I say, even when I was a little kid and didn't know the the joke of it or the texture background of it, now now I do, and it's even better. Yeah. <laughs> That's <it>. awesome. <laughs> I need to see that one again. It's been a long time. Yeah, he's Bill Murray, man. I know, I know. Don't doubt him. Don't doubt him at all. He'll he'll surprise you and bust out. You know this. He'll show up at your wedding. That's true right. too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Cool. Okay, so my uh, my other pick for a. Uh, underrated or unsung uh, scene or, or monologue. To me, I, I think uh, this really should have gotten like some kind of a um, nod in some kind of an award, honestly. I mean, to me, it's like screenwriting and acting d delivering at its absolute best. But uh, in George Romero's Day of the Dead, 1985, um, the character of John or Flyboy played by... Uh, Terry Alexander, uh, who is a Detroiter, by the way, um, the, you know, the guy with the Jamaican accent, in case you're not super familiar with the film. Not you guys, the listeners. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he delivers this monologue, basically, in, uh, it's about halfway through the film, roughly, and uh, it's where um, the, the, the lead character kind of finds those guys out back they have this kind of like little oasis set up with like uh, putting green roll up grass and uh, 
Christmas lights hanging up and the it's kind of like behind their little RV trailer. And it's like a very nice little paradise, some Adirondack chairs and all that kind of stuff. And they all split or they all like have a drink um, and they're kind of talking about what's going on. And the whole part that uh, Terry Alexander's character delivers talking about, you know, we have books and records um, for every major storm and uh, microfiche of tax returns and newspaper stories and immigration records and census reports and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and he's trying to, you know, illustrate the point of how we, we think we have control and measurements and uh, a handle on everything. Um, and he goes, uh, n- now, does any of that matter? Um, because all this place is, is a, uh, you know, a giant, uh, 14 mile tombstone, tombstone, tombstone that echoes and everything. And you can hear a couple zombies, you know, roar in the background. I, that, you know, I, I don't want to read it or, or, and I don't know it by heart, but, um, the next time you watch day of the dead, pay attention to that little sequence. And I, I feel like that is one of the best performances you'll ever see. Um, sincerely delivered, uh, eloquently delivered, great writing to deliver is just, and and it also kind of pinpoints and and culminates really of all of George Romero's dead films, really all of them, really. It really nails the whole like essence of that. It's it's that to me the absolutely spectacular. And John Harrison's score behind that really mellows down and and uh, really illustrates and and helps support that whole vibe. It's excellent. Now we do have to say too, if you out there have a unsung, underrated scene or monologue in a film. Let us know in the comments as uh, Aaron checks those comments and then he texts us to, uh, to check them out. Yes, yes. Ask us if you feel like asking us a question or pointing out some cool stuff that we should have uh, talked about or whatever, let us know. Right, or if we messed up a fact or something because, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or if I recommend a movie that shit, feel free to point that out, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Right. Because, <laughs> oh, you know, my taste is questionable. Questionable at best. At best. At best. I, I know. Okay, so now we're going to take care of some Voyager 3 news. There's a whole lot happening in our bubble right now because of New York Ninja. Um, we just got word a couple nights ago that the, uh, the Mondo variant of New York Ninja soundtrack on vinyl sold out that was the one that was like orange and green kind of swirl um yep. <clears throat> that, that's gone now so 500 copies hopefully y'all got that thank you yeah thank you very much and uh vinegar syndrome's variant which was like a white and silver splatter that sold out that sold out in like a day because of that that's that huge sale that they do yeah i Black think that Friday. sold out on like new year's like oh, almost right. immediately yeah yeah, so, but the to just today, uh, Death Waltz posted on their Instagram that there's a repress already in the works right now. So sit tight. If you if you missed out, you'll be able to get something soon. Whatever that ends up being, we'll, we'll have to see. That leads us to our other part of, of, of our news is that we put a, another cassette out because both of the two cassettes that we put out already sold out. There was a red, which we called Vengeance Red. The cassette was red tinted, and the back part of the case matched that red tint. Then there was Plutonium Killer Green cassette, which is like a lime fluorescent green cassette, and the back part of the case matched that color too. Those are all gone. So we came up with uh, Shuriken Silver. So the cassette is like a kind of a pearlized silver, grayish, and the back of the case matches that too. We're very coordinated that way. <laughs> so that's yeah, on sale the, now. I think this one was my idea, right? So this is my redemption for the the bad trucker hat idea that I had. <laughs> Greg, it wasn't a bad idea. The trucker hats are great. We can't we can't help it if people don't want to wear the trucker hats. They're great hats. Right. I wear it. It is a great hat. It are is. they still available? They are, yeah. Of course. It, it's a it's a U Pong hat and everything. Um it's yeah, exactly man, what it should available. be. They're out there, but they're going fast. Right, right. So get on so this hang, yeah. Yeah, I, hang on. I literally think there's like fifteen left. Twelve or fifteen. That's not bad. And right. they say Voyager three right across them in red yeah. letters. 
scary no, or, so you don't even is know it, right. that's orange? why they don't that's why they don't sell aaron because you're not committed you sure it's orange? <laughs> Coffee is for closers. Yes. I get, black hat I get with red orange. and orange mixed up all the time. It's a black yeah, hat with our, orange. Our orange winter print. beanie of for the war mask era. That's a red stitch in the uh, in the black beanie, that's which is also I'm a talking. Yupong beanie, too. That's There's only the war- two of those left. Two oh, war mask one. beanies. I left. knew we had a red hat. Red Man, the trucker hats hat. came out around Halloween. That's why we went with orange. That's right. See, we try to be them. we try to be coordinated, man. Yeah, somehow, <laughs> somehow those trucker hats were a dud. I don't understand why, but hey, yeah, you know, come on, maybe, man. Maybe no the time for trucker this. hats is kind of more in the uh, early two thousands. Is that the case? <laughs> no, I don't no, know. I don't I'm think sure. that's true. They're still popular. I'm I'm calling on everybody who listens to this podcast to prove these guys are wrong and buy a hat. Feel <laughs> <laughs> free. The hat the, 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 the hat was my idea, and I've been paying for it ever since. Okay, well, check this out then. See, we can play fun games like this because this is our podcast and this is our yeah, band. So this is our band because Greg brought this up. Hit him, Steve. Greg, make up a promo code right now. You know, that's a, a little a little word or something, and we're gonna. No one's going to know about this promo code except for people who listen to this podcast. So we're going to, we're going to do, um, uh, how about, how about we go crazy and we do like Make it a 20, 50% a 20. off 50 half price, man, half price. Okay. So Greg, make what's the, the code uh, 20, make the code 20 characters long though. <laughs> so yeah, you're like, Oh, what was that? Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Make ah. it, make it, make it that. Okay. R R R. Okay. Hold on. I got to write this down. R R R A A A U G H. U G H. We don't gotcha. need the exclamation points. No, no exclamation yeah. points. So right, yeah, no it's, exclamation. It's Greg's. Well, yeah, you know what? We might as well because they're on there. You know what I mean? We'll do All exactly right. what the visual looks like. So the two of them. Greg has the old school. That's a fright rags, right? Fright rags. Yeah, a, an old school fright rags creep show shirt of the crate, and we're talking about the. Uh, the word bubble caption uh, of, of, of the crate monster. And it's R R R A A A U G H two exclamation marks after that. So if you Isn't enter it? in that promo code, what? when you buy the hats after this, uh, this podcast airs, it's half off and nobody else knows about it. It's our little secret. Bam. Bam. All right. Hey, that's so fun. We just, we just made that shit up right now because we can what do we that. Can do. The last part of our news is we are returning to the stage and we have some shows booked. We're also returning to conventions uh, in the warm weather months. So we're super excited because both of these conventions we've been to before and we absolutely love them. The first one coming up in April, it's April 22nd through the 24th. at Burton Manor in Livonia, Michigan. It is Astronomicon 5, uh, put on by our buds Twisted. They do such a good job of putting on a festival um, or a convention. It, it, it's unbelievable. It's such a good time. They have the best guests. You There's know who's going to be there? I've, I've been is seeing the, the, the listings every day come up on Nick the um, castle. That's right, the original shape. Original shape? From Halloween, man, I'm bringing my, uh, I'm bringing my repress of that. Yes, I'm gonna and, keep uh, it with me. Bill Mosley's gonna, gonna be there. Keep it with me, Aaron. I don't blame you, you man. You, I'm gonna you keep it right with me. <laughs> There's a bunch of wrestlers there too, like the. Um, Did anybody uh, see us stand in those positions when we were in L.A. Where Nick Castle stood? Yeah, by the head. Yeah, yeah that's Check right. Check out our Instagram. Yeah, you better have seen that. Yeah, we didn't post those pictures so you could not see them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we, we had some fun historical nothing. spots, man. We didn't fly all the way out to California to take pictures of historic <laughs> movie sites so you could ignore it. Yeah, That's right. exactly. That's, That's exactly right. right. So yeah, go remember check the them Pol- out. Remember the Poltergeist house? A lady was, was like, oh, yelling yeah. at us. <laughs> yeah, we were. We were. It's the three of us strangers in this little cul-de-sac. We're looking all at the poltergeist house and we're like going like okay i'm pretty sure it's the house 
um, the, the tree is bigger, you know, and, and there weren't these bushes here, but that looks like the house and we're really digging it. I mean, it just looks like any regular house in this subdivision. And this woman pulls up and she goes, what are you guys doing? And we go, we're looking at the house. <laughs> Right. And you go, and, oh. and I think I, and we go, oh, I think right. I think I said something like, You probably know why, right? Yeah. Right. You did say that. And you know? she goes, <laughs> Not really. And we and then we were like, Well, fuck you then. Don't ask us. <laughs> and and then it turned out she like went up to the porch and like put something on the porch or took something out like she's a neighbor. It wasn't even her house. So I think it was like a Facebook marketplace pickup. She probably PayPal the poltergeist yeah. house. Well, that was a clown. PayPal money and then and then an grabbed old clown the old book or something, whatever it was. <laughs> I think I think we had more of a right to ask her what she's doing there when she's going and taking stuff off the porch. That's right. We're standing out on the street looking at this house in admiration because yep. of uh four decades of movie history. And yeah, she's asking and us what we're doing here. Right. You she, better do some research. She was probably and know stealing what this house means to people. That's yeah, what I'm saying. She was stealing the yeah. UPS box in there because she thought it was an iPhone or something. <laughs> and, and not for nothing, but Simi oh, Valley is not that close to LA. <laughs> Remember how far we drove to get out there? And you guys are kind of like, seriously, Greg? Like, <laughs> we're like way out there. And I was like, well, I mean, in a roundabout way. If you go the long way, this is kind of on the way to the theater where New York Ninjas show. <laughs> uh, it was, I got no complaints being out there. I, you, that was where they probably filmed about 100 movies. It was a great trip. Nice. Great. All right, it worked out. So check our Instagram for those pictures. But Nick Castle is going to be at Astronomicon. See you. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. what wrestlers, Steve? Um, Scott Hall, I believe. And right. the other one that was in um, that group that was kind of, they were bad guys in the... Kevin Nash? Yeah, Nash. I, I'm pretty sure he's going to be there. Um, man. Oh, and the the kid. I mean, you know, not a kid anymore, obviously, but the kid from Goonies. Or I'm, I'm sorry, Zach. not Goonies. Uh, Gremlins. Zach. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a lot. They've been listing so many uh, the last Daniel couple Harris. days. Daniel Harris from Halloween 4 and 5. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. David Howard Thornton from uh, Terrifier. Has anybody seen Terrifier 1 and 2? No. Is, is it on Tubi? That, man. Huh. Also, PJ Souls, man. So a lot of lot of Halloween Carrie. actresses. PJ Souls from Carrie, Halloween, um, yep. Devil's Rejects, Stripes, yep. Rock and yeah. Roll High School. Scott Hall. Sean X Pack, Kevin Nash, Damian Leon. He was the director of Terrifier. And then Zach Galligan. And of nice. course, our good friend Dirk Manning. Yeah, nice. man. Yeah, it's going to be so great to hang out with Dirk. Yeah. We're going to have to have some ice cream with him. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Very cool. And uh, Aaron can sing some karaoke because Dirk is a serious karaoke yeah. singer. He, ver- he, takes, gets, he takes Aaron it very seriously and he's very good at it. I've seen times. video. Yeah. Sweet. Heck yeah. So we're going to be there all weekend. We have a table. We're going to have all of our merch, all of our vinyl albums, including New York Ninja, um, and some surprise stuff, some stuff that you've never seen before, all kinds of fun, cool stuff. We'll be signing stuff and hanging out and telling stories. We may even try to do like an episode of our podcast from there. Um, I thought that'd be a cool idea just to kind of take it on the road and, and have one you know, in the hustle bustle of, uh, of Astronomicon five. So that is April 22nd through 24th at Burton Manor in Livonia, Michigan. Then the other convention that we're going to be at this year so far is Motor City Nightmares. That is July 29th through the 31st at the, uh, at the, um, Sheraton Detroit Novi. Novi. Yep. That's right. Um, and we're going to play that. Yes, th- that that one, Motor City Nightmares, we're playing, playing live with um, we're playing live with uh, the, the amino acids, so that's going to be really cool. So the the whole convention goes all day long, and then at about uh, maybe eight thirty at night or so, they open up this other ballroom, and there's a stage set up, and there's a bar, and it's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of the guests there, and the stars there, and just patrons who who kind of buy a ticket to the after party, and there's a Voyager 3 concert happening. So it's going to be very fun. So get your tickets to all these things 
and come and hang out. We're going to have a great time. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget Motor Motor City Nightmares. We were playing the the after party, and uh, you know they were just like Tom. I was standing right next to Tom Atkins. Yeah, and like you just don't even know what to say. I was just like, <laughs> so of course I did like the lamest thing possible. I was just like, I love all your movies, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, cool. <laughs> and, so anyways yeah yeah motor city nightmares is awesome yeah absolutely. Blast. and it's it's topped off by the fact that we get to play at the end of the night and uh okay so the last piece of business that i wanted to mention is a one on a little bit of a sad note unfortunately but uh um we just saw uh in the, over the last couple of days that uh a absolutely phenomenally talented writer, producer, and director has passed away, Ivan Reitman, um, responsible for so many outstanding films that um, really are like the archetypal for modern comedies. And, and, uh, and, and, and or my I, childhood. Totally. <laughs> Pretty absolutely. much. I, I, I went looking at all the stuff that he did just to kind of remind myself. And, I mean, there's the obvious stuff. You know, we all know Ghostbusters and um stripes and uh meatballs but uh twins yeah i i love that as a kid man i, I saw twins i loved it <laughs> and yeah, also um great. kindergarten cop i mean who doesn't quote yeah. it's not a tumor right i mean it's not know. a tumor <laughs> but um one super special connection for me that he did that i had no idea that he did this until i researched for this episode to have a little bit of stuff to talk about and you know remind myself exactly what he did did you guys know i mean I, I i know you don't know this so i'm gonna i'm gonna let you know one of my favorite 80s schlocky sci-fi films happens to be space hunter adventures in the forbidden zone he i knew you were gonna say space hunter he executive produced that so he i know he, he helped create that movie by you know by paying for it so holy yeah, moly money. man Put, yeah putting money up he had molly ringwald in it um and of course, um, Michael Ironside, uh, Ironside as the overdog, uh, just so good, man. So so good. Ernie Michael Hudson Ironside, was in it. come on, man, he's the best. I know, super good. So yeah, he was responsible for bringing that movie to life. So thank you, if if for nothing else, Ivan, for doing that because <laughs> I love that. I saw it at the theater, loved it. You got so, another you know. one to add. What's that? As a lifelong Howard Stern fan. He produced Private Parts. Nice. Have you, so have you ever seen the Howard Stern movie? Private oh, yeah. Parts, it's great. Absolutely. Yeah. He produced he heavy metal too, that. believe it or not. Yep. So yeah, that's a that's a major blow. His yeah. son doesn't it his son does movies too, right? Yeah, his son was yeah. uh the, the the director for the um most recent Ghostbusters Afterlife. He he right. directed that. Um, but he's done some other stuff too that's pretty good. So yeah, yeah I mean it's... he's acted too, I believe. Um, all kind of all kind of stuff. He's been in the in the biz for a while now. You know, just taking after his father. But Jason uh, Reitman. Yeah, seventy five anyway, is too young. Shout man. out to Ivan Reitman, man. Yeah, but Stripes I mean, is Stripes is one of my favorite comedies of all time, and it's one of the earliest I comedies I remember seeing as a kid. Like. When I was a little kid, it was the the funniest movies to me were the ones that had Saturday Night Live people. So, yeah. Neighbors, and, Stripes, yeah, you had them all on that Blues one. Brothers, Animal House. Those were the like those were the first comedies I ever attached to, and and so Stripes is a huge part of my childhood coming up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's even responsible. All the heavy hitters in yeah. uh, in Stripes. John Candy, sure. Harold Ramis. Bill Murray. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. PJ Souls. We just mentioned her. John Larrick. John Larroquette. Sean Young. Everybody was in that movie. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, he didn't even rest on his laurels, in my opinion, either, because he was even responsible for some of, like, the transition into the newer era of comedies, like with Will Ferrell and stuff like that, because he was uh, a producer of old school and another favorite comedy of mine is I Love You Man. I know I've talked about that before on yeah. this podcast. He's with Paul Rudd and 
in my opinion, John Favreau steals that film with that one character and and all his lines in there. It's just so good. So uh, that's more modern stuff that doesn't uh, you know live in the eighties and the in the early nineties and stuff. So he kept going and kept doing fresh stuff because those movies kind of pushed it into a new era to me. All right, fellas. Well, I think <clears throat> I think that's um all we have for this episode of V three Cast. We covered a lot of ground in this episode. So uh Aaron's stretching, he's so tired. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that modello's kicking in, man. <clears throat> so let's recap it. We have a brand new Dario Argento film coming out soon, Okealu Neri. And uh Shudder gets the uh, exclusive streaming rights to that. So you'll be able to watch it on streaming if you don't have it at a theater near you. And uh the New York Ninja Mondo variant sold out uh in in uh in five days. We have a Shuriken silver cassette for sale in our store that you can get. There's still copies of that left. And uh we went over our in our opinion, uh, an un- unsung, unappreciated, underrated maybe uh, movie scenes or monologues. And uh, let us know yours in the comments if you have one that you think belongs in that category. We gave out a secret discount code, but you have to watch the whole episode to get it. We're not going to give it out during the recap. That's right. What Greg said, that's, a, that's an excellent point. We also talked about Ivan Reitman passing away. Rest in peace, Ivan. And thank you for all the great movies that you directed or wrote or produced or all three. So that does it for this episode of V3 cast, the official Voyager three podcast. We'll see everybody soon.